Lord God, what are you up to today in our lives, in our church, in our world? As your people rebuilt the foundations of their temple in Jerusalem, so you are still a God of rebuilding, rebuilding communities, rebuilding lives. Strengthen us today as we gather together and as we we delve again deeply into the story of Ezra, the rebuilding of the temple, and all of your continued movements in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the basement of the house where I grew up, there was an old record player. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you grew up in a, a, a house that had an old record player in the basement where kids could go down and play records. Uh, and isn't it great to see vinyl make a comeback, by the way, in the world? Yeah. Later on, the record player in the 1980s was replaced with a full-on stereo with great big speakers replete with 18-inch woofers. Remember those things from the 80s, from the 90s? And next to the, the, the record player, the stereo, a stack of old albums. My mom and dad were born in 1927 and 1931, respectively. So the album stack had a lot of standards in it and a lot of old classics, including this album. Anyone have this one growing up? Yeah. Harry Lillis Crosby Jr., Bing Crosby. And one of the songs that Bing Crosby sang this time of year I'll be home for Christmas. Let's try it out for size, shall we? Sing it with me. I'll be home for Christmas. You can count on me. Please have snow and mistletoe and presents on the tree. Christmas Eve will find me where the love light gleams. I'll be home for Christmas if only in my dreams. I think you sang that louder than you did the opening hymn, Lutherans. <laughs> Bing Crosby, love it. Bing Crosby was born in 1903. And one of, the, one of the things about the, his memory and his style is that he made people who were far from home feel warm and happy as they thought about their home. Uh, uh, for example, women and men who served in World War II. It's been said that hardly anyone in the world did more for people who were far from home than Bing Crosby did with his music. But let me just ask you, was home as good as you remember it to be? Or, 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 or maybe, maybe it's the case that, that in our mind we have a little bit of rosy revisionist history and that we've sort of pushed away some of the hardship of home or maybe some of the dysfunction of the home where you, where you grew up. Was home really as good as you remember it to be? Because in truth, coming home for Christmas has always been part joy and part challenge, right? Am I right? Or is it just me? What were our families really like? Lisa and I are empty nesters now, and so, like all empty nesters, we pine for the adult children to come home. We sit by the windowsill and, and, and wait for them to drive up so we can share the holiday with them. But if I were honest, I would have to say, it's not perfect when the children come home. For one thing, I'm an old guy now, and so I get up early, and I roust about the house, and I make too much noise for those millennials. They're all sleeping in their bed, and I'm making too much noise. And they don't like that. My son actually said to me the other day, what are you going to get old person angry about next? <laughs> he coined a phrase just for me, old person angry. And, and that's not a put down to any of you, really. He just loves making fun of me. Uh, he He does. My daughter Hannah will come home for the holiday and she will shame me for not eating enough vegetables, for the number of single-use plastic items in my house. And then she will look at me and she will say, Dad, your eyebrows are out of control. Because this happens to us as we age, right? And so she will actually lay me down on the bed <laughs> and she will pluck my eyebrows. Now, does that sound like I'll be home to, for Christmas to you? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, my, my hairstylist said, Pastor Jeff, you pluck a chicken, 
you tweeze an eyebrow. Very well. Beauty is pain. We understand. But, but uh, the point is, was the, is home for the holidays really all that we remember it to be? Because this is not Bing Crosby right here. Home for Christmas has always been equal parts joy and challenge, if we're, if we're honest with ourselves. Now, let's, took, let's talk about our narrative lectionary today, the rebuilding of the temple. That's our God story. And the story is from Ezra. Ezra's not actually in the verses from today. He's not in the story quite, quite yet. But, but I want to bring you back and, and just remind you of the history that God's people had been defeated by the Babylonians and taken away into exile, right? And they languished in exile. They wanted to go home. You ever read the Psalms? What does Psalm 137 say at the beginning, the first verse of Psalm 137? When we sat by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion by the waters of Babylon. They longed to go home. They longed for that Bing Crosby moment of being to be able to go back to the good times. As a matter of fact, they dreamt that it would be so great to go back home that they believed that it would be like the Garden of Eden all over again just to get back to that land that God had given them. And so then we have the piece that we just read in our God story from Ezra. King Cyrus of Persian, Persia comes and he defeats the Babylonians and he allows the people go, to go back to their homes And a remnant of them did just that. Not all of them, but a remnant went back to their home. And they began to rebuild. And they rebuilt the temple, right? That that long-remembered temple. And then they kept the festival of booths. And as the foundation was being laid, it says the priests were in their vestments. The trumpet players are ready. The people are there, ready to sing. And then this this honest and poignant image. Did, Did you hear it in the reading? Old people who had seen the first house on its foundation wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. Though many shouted for joy so that the the people could not distinguish the sound of the the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. My friends, there is no finer verse in the Bible for me to describe the world that we live in today and and the season of Advent than that right there, that weeping and joy could come so close to one another in this season that we can't even tell them apart. We can't even tell where one ends and the other begins. This is a season in which we hold those things in tension, right? The greatest joy and the greatest sadness. In our staff meeting this week, we sat and we joyfully planned uh, all sorts of ministry and dreamed and laughed together. And we were getting that last Wednesday evening ready for worship on, for Advent. And we planned some f- events for the whole church family on that Wednesday night. And we also planned our church staff party. Did you know that your staff, uh, every year at Christmas, we do a white elephant gift exchange. We give each other silly gifts. We just have this great fun time. And when we, were, when we were done then, we went to pray on the roles of the church as we do every, every Monday in our staff meeting. And here was one of the prayer requests. December 30 marks 11 years since our little boy passed. We miss him every single day. It doesn't get any easier. Just different. We would appreciate prayers for peace, strength, and hope. What do you hear there? Great joy and great sadness close together. So, so you could take your kids out or your family like Lisa and I did last night and go drive around the community and see the beautiful lights that adorn the homes in our community. Or you could take a drive down to Kimball to the place where the American flag is standing now in honor of the three men who died in the helicopter crash last week. James Rogers Jr., Charles Nord, and Court Plantenberg. A friend of ours from church here is a part of that unit. And uh, he actually sent me a text after, it, after the helicopter crash. He said, Pastor Jeff, I'm their doctor. I'm supposed to be with them. I'm supposed to take care of them right now. But I'm being deployed, and he, and he left on Saturday. And in the text, he said, this is our medevac company. They are air ambulances of the battlefield ready to fly in conditions uh, too bad for ordinary missions so that someone who they never met 
can go home and see their children again. And it says in our God story today, the people of God wept when they saw the foundation of the new temple and they cried for joy so loudly that you could not tell one from the other. That's what this season is. Do we still, do we not still live in a world where joy and weeping are hand in hand? We do. One of our prayer concerns this week uh, said, from one of our families said, a friend of our family was up in the attic getting Christmas uh, uh, decorations down. He fell and sustained a head injury and he died. Please pray for that family. That's horrible. That's absolutely horrible. And later in the day, we got a message from someone in our church who said, our daughter's stands are clean. No cancer was detected. That's this season. Just as the people stood and watched the priests in their vestments and the trumpeters ready to play when the temple foundation was laid, just as those people wept and as they shouted for joy, we do the same. And we ask the same question they ask, which is, what's God up to? What is God up to now in our community, in our world, in our lives? What's God up to when we long to go back home and home is not as we remembered it? When home is not as we hoped that it would be? What is God up to in the midst of the brightest joy and the deepest darkness of December? Well, Ezra says that in that moment of joy and weeping, the people sang their faith. The Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. So what we would say is that God is doing what God has always done. God is rebuilding. Because that's what God does. God is rebuilding. Not only temples, but communities and lives. You and me. Every single day. God rebuilds in the waters of baptism when we rise every day and we remember that we have the grace of God in our lives and we repent of our sins and the old sinner is washed away. God rebuilds us as people. God rebuilds as we express generosity in a season of giving. God rebuilds even when things are not as we hoped they would be or not as we remember them as they once were even as we long for that song that we know is out there at Christmas, peace on earth, goodwill to all. Our God is the author of Christmas. But it's not, not merely the Christmas of Bing Crosby. Our God is the author of Christmas, but not merely the holiday past perfection that we recall, and certainly not the Christmas where all our troubles are so far away as the old song says the author of christmas our god is the visionary who brings us the ultimate experience of weeping and joy side by side right good friday's cross and easter's empty tomb and isn't that where this is all headed that's what god is about and if we could walk in that place each day with one another, if we could walk in that place every day where, if, where someone comes to us and says, hey, our son just got his first job. We're so excited. Knowing that the next friend will say to us, we are praying for our daughter's seizures to end. Would you pray with us? Would you pray for us? If we would have the courage to stand in that place with one another and call it Advent, Oh, man, the world would know the church and the body of Christ for what it is truly meant to be, a place where we love one another, a place where God is up to something, a place where joy and weeping mingle so closely together, you can't tell where one ends and the other begins. And a church who invites everyone to know a God who is rebuilding things, who even right now in this moment is rebuilding you and me. Amen.